We're on a mission to explore South Africa. From the wildflowers of the Namakaland. To the majestic mountains of the Cedarburg. From the pristine beaches of the West Coast. To the lush forests of the Garden Route. Let's discover every hidden gem. Every secret haven. And every local hangout. As we take you across the world in a country. These are the Travelier Guides of South Africa. We embarked on this epic 64-day road trip across South Africa to reinvigorate our travel industry after the devastation of the national lockdown. So we approached Sony Alpha SA and they were extremely keen to get involved and lent us the Sony A7 III for the duration of this journey so that we could capture the breathtaking beauty we encountered and share it with you. The accommodation options we are including in this guide were all researched and approached by us. Although we receive sponsored stays, as always, all routes, advice, views and reviews are entirely our own. Let's get this guide going. There is so much we want to show you. There is just so much to see. So let's start at the beginning with our first DTN Route SA travel guide, the world famous Namakuland Flower Route. Dry, arid landscapes transform into vibrant fields of colour, stretching as far as the eye can see. Thousands of species of wildflowers emerge as spring begins to show its face. And the entire west coast of South Africa welcomes all who wish to share in its beauty. Tourists are drawn in by the tremendous displays of colour and tend to follow one of two routes, namely the northern Namaquiland flower route or the southern Cape flower route. Over this, and with brief sections in the next two travel guides, we will show you exactly how to conquer the entire wildflower route. Where to go, when to go, and of course, why to go. These mighty little fighters can be seen sprouting from the earth as early as July in some of the northern regions, hardly ever lasting further than the end of September. So to capture as much of this phenomenon as we can, we always start at the top and set off around mid to late August. Step 1. Starting up in Uppington Established as a mission station in 1871, Uppington has flourished into a thriving town, famous for their raisins, grapes and wines. Their agriculture industry is fed by the Orange River, the longest river in South Africa, which runs directly through the town. With their ideal positioning for the start of our journey and being the only major town that this mighty river passes through, Uppington is the perfect place to start. So let's get there. Unless flying into the Uppington International Airport, you've got quite a long journey ahead of you. So start early. Whether you're starting from Cape Town or Joburg, you're looking at about 10 hours on the road, with a few stops included. We left Johannesburg at 6.30 in the morning and drove 383 kilometers in four hours to our first stop, Mam's Foods. One thing you don't want to compromise on on any road trip is your bathroom stops. Byron and I are very keen on making stops all over the place so we can assure you that this is your best midway bet. It's safe, it has everything you need and the toilets are clean. Although they do cost you two rand each, so make sure you have some coins. We grabbed some toasted sandwiches and hot chocolate from Mam's restaurant, browsed the gift shop, asked for some change from the deli and filled up with some petrol. P.S. If you're traveling as a family, Mam's has a great garden and jungle gym to exhaust the youthful pent-up energy. Our lunch cost us 140 rand, petrol 396 and after an hour we were back on the road. Your night's accommodation is only 405 kilometers away, so another four hours and you will arrive at River Place Manor. This is the first stop on your journey and you're going to want to lay upon the banks of the Orange River, take out the canoes or enjoy some wine, grapes grown by their very own vineyard on this stick right here at sunset. Up until 2011, this beautiful riverfront property was the private residence of owners Pete and Renell. With the humble addition of five rooms to host guests passing through Uppington, River Place Manor was born. Captivated by the mighty orange river that was flowing a few meters from us, our favorite activity was to just sit on the deck with a glass of wine in hand, and the snack platter didn't hurt either. For a closer encounter with the longest river within South African borders, you are more than welcome to paddle out on a canoe, spend an afternoon fishing or get taken out on their pontoon for a braai on the river. 
If you arrived really early and are keen to venture out, the original mission station, now the Kalahari Oranya Museum, is just four minutes away. However, if dinner is more where your mind is focused, hop in the car and head straight down the road to the Brotia Hotel. It's four minutes and 2.1 kilometers away. You can park on the street right in front of the hotel and walk inside to Step 2. Cafe Zest You might want to book if you're traveling in the peak season because this place is popular for all of the right reasons. The mood, atmosphere and staff were all very pleasant and the food, delicious. A humble meal cost us 255 Rand and as far as recommendations go, the grilled chicken salad was a winner. Four minutes and you're back at River Place and ready for a good night's sleep. Breakfast starts at 7, so be up, ready and packed for an early start. We chose to stay an extra day and enjoy all that River Place Manor has to offer. So, whenever you're ready, head on over to... Step 3. Ohrabis Falls National Park. 120 kilometers and one and a half hours from River Place Manor lies the breathtaking Ohrabis Falls. On your way there, don't forget to keep your eyes on the right of the road for Key Solar One. 20 minutes out of Uppington is South Africa's first solar-powered solar thermal power plant. Light is reflected at the boiler atop the 205 metre tall tower and basically you can't miss it. When you arrive at Ohrabis Falls National Park, you can park right at the reception, go ahead and flash your wildcard or pay 59 Rand per person and walk on down to the waterfall viewing platforms. This 56 meter waterfall thunders down into the Orange River Gorge, running 18 kilometers long and 240 meters deep. That means that you could fit the entire Colton Center with a set of rugby posts on top of it and still have a meter or two to spare. As captivating as the falls are, their true namesake of Okoribis or Place of the Great Noise truly comes into play when the Orange River is in flood. The incredible flow has been known to surpass even the record of Niagara Falls. Visiting in the dry season, however, doesn't void this national park of its allure. The boardwalks that connect various viewing platforms never quite allow you to see the entire picture all at once. So we would definitely recommend starting on the right and stopping at each platform as you walk further away. After an hour or so, you can head back to the car and leave. No! <laughs> no, we're joking. <laughs> the next few hours we spent in the park were just as magical and we really can't believe it's so often overlooked. As you head towards the gate, you will see the day visitor's entrance into the main park area to your right. With your 4x4 or sedan, you can go on your very own self-drive. We'll start at Moon Rock, 5.3 kilometers away. This unique landmark is one large rock that offers a great view of the surrounds from on top of it. 5.7 kilometers further down the road are the Oranyakom and Ararat viewpoints. The rugged and vast landscapes of the area can only really be admired from these viewpoints. Walking out onto the viewing decks over the gorge is just gorgeous. Next, we are heading 8.4 kilometers to Echo Corner. Now this, I mean, just look at it. Before we even pulled out the camera, we just clambered out of the car and onto the rocks to just sit and take it in. So take your time. From here, we doubled back and left the park with heavy hearts. Our self-drive excursion did take three hours and we drove 33.3 kilometers. And so we still needed time to get to our next destination. However, if leaving sounds like too much of an ordeal, you can always spend a night or two right here. There is a three-day hike, a few short walks, you can go cycling, swim in the pools, or just witness the Krabi's Falls being illuminated from 8 to 10 p.m. Check your tank before heading out because you can get fuel right here and we have a 300-kilometer, three-hour journey ahead of us to Step 4. Springbok Springbok is the largest town in the Namakuland region and survives predominantly from tourism, mining and farming. Mining, however, used to be their primary source of income as the entire town was founded around copper mining in the area. We just found an Airbnb for the night, grabbed some food from Torin Steak Ranch for 220 Rand and relaxed as the sun went down. The next morning brings us to the reason we did, but possibly shouldn't have, stayed in Springbok. After an early breakfast, we left at 7.30 to head 10.2 kilometers to Khuchap Nature Reserve. We arrived 10 minutes later to a closed gate. I'm 
14 phone calls and Google searches later, with two hours of patient waiting outside and being ignored by the staff that were there, we reluctantly decided to leave. The flowers weren't really abundant in Springbok this year, but we do feel rather sad about it and sort of dissuaded from trying to visit the nature reserve again. Subsequent to our visit, however, we have seen many people enjoying Khrukhap, driving around to spot game, hiking through the nature and picnicking for lunch. If we do this trip again, we definitely will spend the night at a Khrabi's instead. But even though our time in Springbok wasn't the picture of perfect travel, that doesn't necessarily mean that you won't enjoy it yourself. Step 5. The Namaqua National Park Now, if you've come here for flowers, I can't imagine any place sounding more enticing than this. Depart Springbok on the N7 and follow the signs to Hondeklip Bay. After 55 kilometers and 55 minutes, you will see a hand-painted sign pointing up to the right of the road. It's quite faded, but it is directing you to the Otronk. This old prison ruin housed the prisoners sent out from Cape Town in the 1860s to build the passes that you are driving on right now. The Messelpat and Wilde Paardehoek passes were established to ferry copper ore to Hondeklip Bay for export. We ourselves never stopped, as the road veering up there looked a little too rough for our little sedan. But then again, this entire route is actually restricted to 4x4s only. You'll notice we were a little too preoccupied with the driving to film anything, but we were able to make it in a sedan. It's by no means the easiest drive, but wending through the mountains and along the Buffels River Valley was awesome. Continuing along the road towards Subatsfontein, you will officially enter the Namakwa National Park, home of the world's smallest tortoise, the Namakwa speckled padloper. You may not pick, remove or damage flowers, but please stop your car and enjoy them. Smell the flowers, pull up a chair, take cover from all of the sand when another car passes. A further 31.6 kilometers from the Otronk comes your next major decision, and it is one we got wrong. You will see signs pointing towards the skill putt section. We opted to skip it, but you should not. 4x4s can turn left here, sedans should go straight. Skill putt Nature Reserve is where this national park began and is still the most visited attraction. The 5 km circular drive is the most popular activity. However, you can explore on your own mountain bike. There are two 2 hour hikes to enjoy, a picnic area, ablutions and a kiosk. Since the park is still developing, we'll have to just make another trip back here and do it all ourselves. If you don't want to risk the passes in a sedan as we did, you can follow the national park directions from the N7 to get straight to the Skilpat office. Do note that it's only open to the public during spring and there is an entrance fee required. Back to Subatsfontein, we turned right instead and headed towards Hondeklip Bay. 32.5 kilometers down the road, you will be confronted by a gate. Fear not. You can open and close it yourself. As the sign suggests, you can turn right towards Hondeklip Bay. Along the road, we passed the entrance to the coastal section of the national park to our left. We didn't want to push our luck with soft sand roads, but we'll definitely come back to explore it with a 4x4. There is a 6km whale and dolphin spotting hike, campsites all along the coastline, and we've heard flower displays that are worth it in themselves. 22.8 kilometers further on this dirt road will lead you to the hidden coastal town of Hondeklip Bay, where you can stay right here at Honahoka. A dip in the pool, a few games to blow off some steam, or even a bright sunset should set you right for tomorrow's adventures throughout town. Ati found his home as a young man on a sea and sun course. Walking out on a jetty in the scarcely populated town, he uttered the words, I can see myself living here until I die. A holiday home turned actual home gave way to the beginnings of the Honohoka Resort. Living here before sewage, water and electrical infrastructure had been developed shows Ati's passion for the small town he calls home. But fear not, those are not issues you'll be dealing with. After a stressful day of looking at all those flowers, an evening braai at Honohoka at step 6 is the best way to unwind. Breakfast at the Honohoka is a very relaxed affair. Without ruder times or menus, a quick chat will arrange your perfect morning meal. And then it's off to step 7, the Honohoka Bai Lighthouse. It's less than a 2 km stroll from the Honohoka and along the coast. You can walk right up to the lighthouse fence, but unfortunately you cannot go inside. 
The paths also do carry along the coastline and you can walk as far as you'd like. We love the fact that there is a braai stand right in front of the lighthouse facing the ocean. What a beautiful place to cook some food at sunset. This is also a great vantage point of the town. Looking over the small town, we couldn't help but imagine how dynamic its development has been, how it has changed from copper ore export to rule of the crayfish factory and even submitting to 20 years of diamond mining. Before actually arriving at the lighthouse, you will pass the Jalil shipwreck. This diamond gravel boat dropped anchor in Honikla Bay after being refused refuge in Port Nolith. Without proper moorings, it destroyed the two boats on either side of it as the townsfolk watched in dismay and was taken out to sea during a rough storm. The next morning, the Jalil was spat out onto the rocks where she now resides, slowly being reclaimed by the ocean. That little story quite perfectly segues us to Step 8, the Aristea Shipwreck. From Honohoka, jump in your car and drive towards Lookout Rock. Do not follow your GPS to the Aristea Shipwreck. You can hop out at the viewpoint, walk around and even spot a couple more bright stands set up for you to enjoy. From there, continue straight along the road, totaling 4.3 kilometers since Honohoka and you will arrive at the Aristea shipwreck, perfectly marked by two poles that once held a sign. Of course there is another bright stand with a bench at the ready should you be more prepared than us, or else you can just wander around the Aristea and try to picture her in her prime. Born in Scotland, served five years as a fishing trawler for INJ before being called into action as a minesweeper in World War II. Eight months after returning back from the war, she ran aground at the age of 12, taking one of the 24 lives aboard. Heading 3.1 kilometers back into town, you will come across Step 9, the town's namesake, Honda Clip. Opposite the police station stands the inspiration for Thomas Grace's naming of the village. Translating to Dogstone, two incidents have befallen this landmark making his vision hard to picture clearly. In 1853, the ear was removed and allegedly taken to Cape Town to start a fake company called the Dog's Ear Copper Company. While in the 1970s, his nose was struck off during a violent storm. We walked around it a bit and personally found that if you stand facing the ocean, you can kind of see a dog in it, right? You're probably feeling the pangs of hunger by now, so let's head to Step 10, Dop and Kreev. Just over 2 minutes and 800 meters away, you're in for some fresh seafood. We spent 190 rand. The most important thing to do here, and probably in this entire guide, is to look out for this boat. For obvious reasons. I feel like it just makes your whole journey worthwhile. Once you've hopefully tracked down a boat named Tammy, you've got just under half a day for Step 11. Enjoy Honda Clip Bay. We saw families playing volleyball on the beach. You can track down Spuck Clip behind the old crayfish factory. You can choose your favorite braai setup and head there for the afternoon. Or you can simply relax at Honohoka. We opted for the two minute, 650 meter drive back to enjoy the undercover swimming pool pool table and table tennis. You should also take a moment to walk around and look at their collection of art, antiques and relics. They are so fascinating and each comes with their own story. This life ring for instance once lived aboard the Jalil, the shipwreck on the way to the lighthouse. Depending on your choice of afternoon activity, you might be spending your evening out having a braai in front of the ocean, cooking dinner in your room, out at a restaurant or chatting away with Esme and Ati. If you have chosen the latter, you may just be regaled with tales from their youth or enjoy some live music by candlelight. Whatever you choose, I'm sure it will be a memorable final evening in Honda Clip Bay. You can arrange to have your breakfast a little earlier the following morning so that you're on the road by 8. It's going to be a good drive because we're heading to Van Reinsdorp via Step 12, the Haris Road. This stretch of road showed us the best display of flowers in the area and we stopped multiple times just to get a closer look. So the 234 kilometers took us just over three hours instead of two and a half, but it was very worth it. We were initially heading towards Bethel's Clip, but the GPS led us to a private road and turning left from the N7 would have added an extra 70 kilometers that we weren't petrally prepared for. If you would like to visit this historical and religious site, be sure to follow the Kharis road all the way to the N7 and turn from there. Keep an eye on your own fuel gauge too. There's a nice petrol station and convenience store as you turn into Van Rainstorp. However, you might want to hold off on the snackery for a further 18 minutes and 26.9 kilometers 
to Step 13 Baghdad Cafe. Between Norway and Norway, you come across this quirky cafe that's famous for their pancakes. Browse the rows of books and trinkets, explore their eccentric design, read their quotes scattered all around, and if you're here on a Sunday, consider phoning ahead to book a seat at one of their famous Sunday lunches. Coffee and pancakes will only set you back around 85 Rand, and you're ready to head off 11.8 kilometers and 12 minutes to Van Rains Pass. The best viewpoint is near the top of the pass, on the opposite side of the road, so be sure to keep an eye out and ensure it's safe to cross the road and stop before you do. The viewpoint is just after a very sharp hairpin bend and as you look down the pass, you're standing in the Northern Cape looking out at the Western Cape, separated in the middle of that very turn. Random trivia aside, the vast open vistas seen from here and even the rock face behind you are truly stunning. Our next stop is 25.3 kilometers and 30 minutes away and it's time to get excited. We are about to enter the bulb capital of the world. Nivertville is a quiet town in the Namakwa district of the Northern Cape. Humbly, this village draws attention from across the globe for its rich diversity and impressive flower displays in the springtime. The best show of flowers varies from year to year. However, Nivertville was a clear winner this year and always seems to be somewhere in the top. As you drive towards town, it becomes apparent. The roads are just lined with bright yellow, white and orange flowers stretching as tall as they can. You might be inspired to pull over especially as you turn into town, but we encourage you to push on to Step 14. The Mikey's Fontaine Pudstal and Flower Route The flower route in South Africa has worldwide renown and this was where we began to understand why. After you've parked, jump out and head into the actual farm store. You can grab a snack, something to drink, which in hindsight would have been a good idea. You can familiarize yourself with the flowers of the area, read up on the farm and ask any questions you may have before you pay your 25 Rand each. From there, you jump back into your car and follow the white arrows along a route that's supposed to be around 13 kilometers, but was 7.8 kilometers in reality. Unless we missed out an entire section, but either way, we weren't disappointed. You're actually encouraged to pull over, kick off your shoes and walk amongst the daisies. It's a great place to meet some friends and share your flower finding victories. And if we had been as well kitted as a few other families that we passed, we would have pulled out our chairs and cooler box and just taken it all in. Without chairs, snacks or a picnic, we spent two hours here. So with your forewarning, you should budget around three to four hours here. It's really a place you'll want to spend some time. Once you are ready to move on, take a short drive to step 15, the glacial pavement. It is conveniently just 5.7 kilometers and 7 minutes along your way back into town. There's a small parking area on the side of the road and then you can simply walk in for free. You can walk along, look at and even touch these ridges that were formed by ice flow over 300 million years ago as southern Africa migrated over the South Pole. Geology is not really our forte, but by just blindly trusting what was written on the plaque, we enjoyed a moment of imagining and taking in this historical site. Step 16. Linda Sadop. 8.8 kilometers and 14 minutes separates you from your night's accommodation. Linda Sadop, where you can relax poolside, have a braai on the deck, or relax right here in the garden courtyard. Linda never came to the small town to start her own boutique hotel. However, her warm hospitality, lovely property and excellent location keep people coming back. So whether you're looking for a quick dip after a hot day, a relaxing briar with the family or just very comfortable accommodation with the right ratio of luxury to homely, you've got it. There are a few restaurants in the area and Linda can guide you in your choosing. However, we opted for the traditional South African farm styled cooking Linda does herself while we enjoyed her company and tales of her travels around the world. The next day begins with some delicious breakfast at Linda Sadop before heading 7.7 kilometers and 9 minutes to step 17, the Nivotville waterfall. This 90 meter waterfall staggers the Duarung River and is most impressive after heavy rains. Even in the dry season though, it's still worth a visit. You'll need to hand over 25 Rand per person at the entrance. The pathway from the parking lot is very short and we'd suggest keeping left at the initial split. This will give you the best vantage point of the main waterfall and then take you back via the smaller one. 
Once you get to the main waterfall, there are a few great vantage points to choose from. You can perch yourself on a rock in the shade or just meander through the flowers as the water echoes in the canyon below. Continue the loop for your walk back when you're ready to leave and jump into your car for the next 8.2 km 6 minute drive to Step 18, the Nivodeville Wildflower Reserve. 25 Rand per person gets you in here too and you have a choice of straight or left. We'd recommend starting left. As you drive along the road, you can't help but stare at the endless fields of colour as the flowers stretch up to the sun. We parked somewhere in the middle and just got out and walked. The air smells sweet, the bees are buzzing and life is good. Further along the road, you get to a circle behind the rocks. You can park there and climb up to the lookout point. This is where you can really see how the colours cover the landscape. We noticed that different coloured flowers flourished in different areas. This wildflower reserve, however, had the best mix of vibrant colours in the same area that we came across on our travels. The loop is about 2 kilometres long and going the other direction is a similar distance. So if you'd like to explore more of the reserve, have a picnic or just sit and take it in for longer, you have more than enough space to choose from. We chose to leave around lunchtime and make the massive 2.9 kilometre and 4 minute track to Step 19, Ein Giese Erdblatt. With a small menu and no extra frills, you can expect a delicious local meal without a hefty price tag. Lunch only cost us 120 Rand and our energy was back, ready for us to conquer Step 20, the Huntum Botanical Gardens. It's only 3 kilometers and 8 minutes away, so be sure you've entered the correct place into your GPS. In Google Maps, it's the Huntum National Botanical Garden, not gardens. It's actually simple enough to get there without technology. Just continue down the main road you're already on. It will turn into a sand road and then there will be a botanical garden sign pointing to the left. This too has a 25 Rand entrance fee only during the flower season. Again, and as you'd expect, there are some magnificent flower displays, but you have the opportunity for even more. From August to October, there are guided tours that take place every day from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. Not surprisingly, they get booked out quickly, so don't be us. Make sure you phone ahead and book your spot. Driven tours are 150 Rand per person, while walking tours are 50 Rand per person. This is something we would have loved to have done, so it's definitely on our list for next time. No matter when you're visiting, there are 9 short trails you can do, ranging from 450 meters to 8.2 kilometers. It's time to head back into town for our final stop of the day. It should take you no more than 8 minutes to travel 3.2 kilometers to step 21, the Nivotville in Gierkerk. Established in 1897, this Table Mountain Sandstone Church was an integral part of establishing the town that stands today. Still an operational church, you are more than welcome to walk around the grounds and even inside the church itself. Whether you are a fan of history, religious sites or just admiring beautiful buildings, you will definitely enjoy a short visit here. Not so much a fully fledged step, but rather some advice is to drive straight out of the church and stop at the petrol station immediately on your right. They have the only tyre pump in town and leaving with a full tank of fuel is always a good idea. Then it's 6 minutes and 1.6 kilometers back home to Lindus Adop for a hearty meal and a good night's rest. And that's it! But not really. Our journey continues on to the Cedarburg Mountains in our next Travel Your Guide. So step 22 is to click the card right up here or follow the link in our description to be taken to our next guide which will seamlessly continue on from your next morning in Nivotville. Don't forget that you can navigate all of our travel guides using the link chapters to make sure you don't miss a thing. Before you head off though, let's wrap up our Namaqualand Flower Route travel guide with a look at the costs and a few tips and tricks we learned along the way. A brief look at our costs for these 6 days of travel reveal that we spent an average of 140 Rand a day on lunch, 250 for our 4 dinners and received free breakfast all around. Including petrol, activities and accommodation, it totals to 13,720 Rand or 1,144 Rand per day per person sharing. We didn't include the 59 Rand each for the Hrabis Falls National Park as we had purchased a wildcard before setting off. 
We purchased the All Parks Cluster for 1,190 Rand, which came in extremely handy and worked out a lot cheaper over our entire road trip. Over the course of our epic South African road trip, we learned a lot of handy tips and tricks that would amp up all of your travels, including simple items to keep with you at all times, important aspects to plan ahead, and fun ideas to ensure you're ready for whatever adventure comes your way. So before heading off on SA Roads, make sure you've read what you need to know before embarking on a South African road trip. You can find it linked below or on deartraveleur.com. Plus, you can download our free packing list that we use for all of our SA expeditions. Don't forget that most accommodations are booked up a year in advance for the flower season, so the best time to start planning is right now. The best months for flower spotting vary based on the winter rainfall, but are usually between August and October, with the best time of day being between 10am and 4pm. Finally, if you're planning on ending off your trip right here, there are a few other nearby attractions you may be interested in, such as visiting the historical Huntum Hayes for breakfast in Calvinia. While there, spotting the large flower post box, admiring the church, possibly visiting the local market, hiking in the Akarindam Nature Reserve and visiting the abandoned railway station. There is also the option of some more serious hiking in the Urlochskloof Nature Reserve if you have five days to spare. However, from our end, the next morning in Nivotville is where our journey continues. So be sure to follow our next travel guide as we explore South Africa together. And while we're in the spirit of following things, at Dear Traveller on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date with all of our tips, tricks and travels. And we'd also like to keep up to date with your travels. So tag us online and use the hashtag DTNRouteSA if you find yourself conquering this very route. We hope to see you in the next one. And... As always, enjoy your journey!